all of you to the this seminar in the Law and Humanities seminar series here at the Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dashi Guoji Fa Shui Yuan. Uh, and welcome to all of you who are here in person. And I would also like to extend a special and warm welcome to those of you who are joining us on Zoom. We're very privileged and honored today to have as our speaker, Professor Stuart McManus, who teaches at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in their Department of History. I'll just briefly introduce uh, Professor McManus before uh, giving him the floor. Uh, Professor McManus is a legal historian who works uh, broadly on transnational legal history, but especially on topics including law, slavery, and empire in world history from a global and multi-ethnic perspective. And he has also taught at the University of Chicago uh, and is the author of a very interesting book, which I commend to all of you, uh, Empire of Eloquence, the Classical Rhetorical Tradition in Colonial Latin America and the Iberian World, which was published uh, by the Cambridge University Press in 2021. And I am told that um, we have another book to look forward to shortly. Um, Professor McManus is, is working on a second book, which is looking at the famous 1619 slave voyage to Virginia and the various legal historical issues in that. And Professor McManus today will speak to us on doing legal history, a very practical guide. And just a few administrative things before we begin. Professor McManus will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will open the floor for questions. Uh, for those of us, for those of you, excuse me, who are joining on Zoom, if you have questions during the seminar, feel free to write them in the chat box. And for those of you who are here in person, obviously <laughs> feel free to ask your questions directly. Uh, I would like to now give the floor to Professor McManus. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Ho, for the very generous introduction, uh, and of course, uh, to you all uh, for coming. Uh, I want to start today uh, by just saying a couple of words, uh, a couple of additional words uh, about my background uh, to give you a sense uh, of what's, what you're going to be subjected to for the next uh, 40 to 45 uh, minutes. Um, so, as Professor Ho mentioned, um, I'm a specialist in pre-modern uh, Europe uh, and its empires uh, and the legal history uh, thereof. Uh, I, I come to legal history um, and, uh, and my uh, affiliation with uh, CUHK Law uh, with a background uh, in what we might call archival history which I'll talk about more later, and Western classics. Uh, in particular, uh, Roman law and its reception in Europe and its empires, what you might elsewhere hear called the civil law tradition writ large. OK? Um, so uh, on the basis uh, of this background, um, I'm going to try and uh, Distill uh, some of the some of the things I've learned over the years about practicing uh, legal history, um, but of course I'm going to be uh, coming to this uh, from my own particular background, uh, which, uh, as I said, is the, uh, the civil law tradition, and to a lesser extent, uh, the common law tradition in pre-modern Europe uh, and the parts of the world touched by European expansion from about 1500 onwards. Um, I'd also like to just sort of mention, especially uh, as we're both, uh, both Professor Ho and I are uh, students of the same teacher to some extent, um, that the origins of my approach, um, I, I would trace to my time studying with this a very fine gentleman here. This is uh, Charlie Donahue. Um, who has taught for many years and continues to teach um, a, 
uh, a really great uh, legal history course for graduates and uh, undergraduates uh, at Harvard. Um, and um, what, what I hope um, uh, that, that I might have inherited from Charlie Donahue, and I, and, and, uh, I, I think uh, Professor Ho's work certainly um, shows these characteristics, um, are what I call philological rigor uh, and a rich contextual understanding of the law and its development. Um, philological rigor, uh, by that I mean careful reading of texts in their original languages um, with attention to the text and its transmission, um, often from manuscript into print into modern critical edition, uh, and then, of course, uh, context being uh, the home of the historian, right? A multifaceted, expansive understanding uh, of the world uh, in which uh, laws were codified and practiced. Uh, so, um, if you're, uh, yes, just to give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'm going to say a few words briefly about uh, what is methodology. I'm then going to talk about sources in legal history, uh, from the printed book to the archive. Um, I'm then going to talk about working with sources, uh, languages, scripts, uh, and context. And then I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about uh, more practical issues, such as publishing um, in the field of legal history. And uh, of course, a big question, uh, that uh, people in all fields ask, uh, why are we doing this particular type of scholarship? Why do we do legal history? Um, I've, I've also given you a sort of uh, a list of further reading if you're interested. Um, if you're interested in um, Charlie Donahue and his approach to legal history, uh, I commend to you this uh, wonderful article um, that he wrote in his first Fest Schrift where he outlines exactly how he came to be uh, the eminent legal historian uh, he is today uh, and uh, how he approaches um, the field. Um, so that's, a really, that's really, really worth reading. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll also mention, uh, some of you might have read this, uh, some sort of classics in legal history, in Anglophone legal history. Uh, uh, Henrik Hartog's Pigs and Positivism, right? A, a wonderful title to a wonderful article. Um, I'd also uh, mention uh, Judith Serkis's uh, Sex, Law, and Sovereignty in French Algeria, if you're interested in uh, post-colonial approaches to law. Uh, that's a really uh, tremendous... Um, it's now no longer forthcoming. It's, it's now actually uh, being published. Um, and those of you interested in sort of combining legal history with, I guess, sort of francophone, French-style philosophy, um, then uh, Didier Fassin's The Will to Punish is a wonderful combination of uh, uh, legal history uh, and a sort of Foucauldian philosophy. So uh, lots of interesting things on that list, I, I hope. So um, I might just begin by addressing what might seem like an obvious point. Um, what is methodology? Um, may, may, and I try to sort of distill this in the sort of the clearest way possible. Um, so I think methodologies are approaches to history, in this case legal history, uh, that have one or more of the following characteristics, okay? So uh, a theoretical perspective or focus on a particular domain of law, uh, here often borrowing from other fields. Um, as a humanistic discipline, uh, legal history uh, is open to many different types of approaches um, that can cross-pollinate it. Uh, sociology, anthropology, political theory, um, all sorts, I guess, um, even the natural sciences with sort of approaches uh, to the history of um, envir the environment and law nowadays. Uh, these can all enrich uh, the study of legal history 
uh, and might uh, be considered different method methodological approaches. Um, another aspect of methodology uh, pertains to the particular source base that we choose, which will affect uh, how, how we read the text, uh, how we contextualize it, uh, and so forth. Um, this can range much more widely than you might think. Okay? Legal historians are not just reading statutes and case law. They're reading all sorts of documents, notarial documents, um, wills and testaments. Um, so they're sometimes studying architecture of um, 16th century courtrooms in Ecuador, in Latin America. Right? There are all sorts of different sources. Um, and this will affect how you approach the study of legal history. Um, and then, of course, there are different, what we might call, tools uh, you can use. Okay? Um, as I said, legal history is a humanistic discipline. So often, uh, we're interested in uh, reconstructing, reading, analyzing, and communicating texts of different sorts. Okay, just like our, our colleagues in other types of history, uh, in literature, philosophy, uh, and other humanistic uh, disciplines. Um, these, however, are developing disciplines uh, to which new digital methodologies can also be applied. So we can do uh, legal history using text mining. Okay, uh, we can use digital mapping. There's some wonderful uh, digital, uh, digital maps uh, of um, all sorts of things related uh, to legal history now. Um, these are all possible tools that we can use. Um, and so, I guess, also comes under what we might call methodology. Um, methodology is also not certain things. Okay? Methodologies are not prisons, and they define your method not your answer. That's something important to remember. Um, methodologies help you ask interesting questions. Okay, they are not ideology. There is room for divergence and interpretation. At the same time, methodologies are not exclusive. Uh, we should be uh, like, this, like this person in this 14th century English manuscript. We should be like cooks. We should mix and match. Um, to become a great cook, it's not about following the recipe necessarily. Okay, It's about gaining a deep understanding of taste and ingredients and then bringing them together in a particularly, hopefully, delicious way. Okay, That's how you should think about methodology. Okay. Um, I'll talk now a little bit about some of these, uh, I guess, uh, more theoretical uh, approaches. Okay, um, with with theory, what we generally have is two things. Okay, uh, theories generally come with them uh, a vision of law and a vision of history. So, let's take a very practical example. Uh, if you read that wonderful article on pigs and positivism, okay, uh, you find uh, that the particular author, uh, Hendrik Hartog, has a view of history. His view of history is that it involves, this is roughly a quote from him, the constant interplay of historical actors and plural normative orders. Okay, different sorts of structuring norms, okay, including customs, so both written law and unwritten law. That's his vision of history, okay, and that gives him a very powerful, uh, a powerful methodology, a powerful way of looking at 18th and 19th century American law and society. Um, law, within this vision, is according to Hartog, an arena of conflict within which alternative social visions uh, are contended, bargained, and survived. Okay? Um, 
Now, uh, this is what we might call a sort of um, a, a kind of um, pluralistic, pragmatic um, uh, sort of uh, theoretical approach. Um, there are others uh, rooted in, in sort of stricter philosophical traditions. Uh, there is a post-colonial theory-driven approach, history as a struggle between colonial powers and oppressed peoples, okay? Uh, a struggle characterized by be it negotiation or uh, direct, uh, sometimes even violent interchanges, okay? And there's a whole philosophical literature on, on which this is based. Um, and of course, within this, law then becomes a way to either oppress people or resist oppression. Okay, uh, that, that's the sort of post-colonial uh, approach. Uh, for those of you interested in sort of historical methodology, I'm not going to talk too much about it, um, but you will find certain trends uh, within legal history that are shared with other social sciences. Okay, uh, you know, if you take a, a law and society approach to legal history, you will find friends among the social historians in history departments. Uh, and you will find friends among certain anthropologists. Because all humanistic disciplines, um, to, to some extent, swim in the same waters, are influenced by the same philosophical currents at different times. Um, so, uh, there's one particularly exciting area of legal history at the moment. Uh, I just want to finish this section talking about this. Uh, this is global, so-called global legal history. Okay, um, one I think that interests a lot of people because of our current interest in globalization uh, and its possible uh, reversals, maybe. Um, so, again, we have a view of history, we have a view of law. Okay, history in global legal history is potentially planetary. Okay, it's not necessarily national, it's not necessarily regional, nor civilizational. Uh, it is looking at the world from a fully zoomed out perspective. Then, what is law? Well, within this vision, uh, law becomes something that is by necessity mobile. Okay, this is the world of legal transplants as it was famously called by one Scottish historian of Roman law, okay? Um, you can have legal traditions that might start in ancient Rome, uh, but somehow find their way to uh, reforming Meiji Japan uh, and uh, to other parts of Asia as well, across large spans of time and across large distances, okay? Um, in other words, global history, global legal history, is an approach that centers on thinking about geography, or more precisely, meta-geography. How do we divide up the world? What does our mental map look like when we think about history? Um, and uh, when, I, when I introduce this, uh, I often play a little game with my students. Um, so uh, let's imagine we want to study um, something that might seem narrowly, um, sort of uh, narrowly defined. Okay, let's imagine we want to study the Roman delict of outrage in Uria. Okay, a very very interesting feature of Roman law uh, and its influence. If we want to do this from a global perspective, imagine you're on your phone and you're playing with you know, Baidu or Google Maps. Okay? Now, you could take, say, an urban history approach to this particular delict. You could study, um, you know, its, its development, codification, impact, uh, reception within the city of Rome, okay? The core of the original empire, okay, which began as a city state. We're pretty zoomed in here on the map. And many people do. And it's very interesting and important. Um, we may then take a national or imperial approach. The delict within 
the entire Roman Empire uh, for, say, its reception in the civil law of um, early, uni you know, early unified Italy, a national approach. Um, we might even zoom out and look at it within European history or Western history, sort of broadly defined. Um, or we might zoom out even further. We might look at how what began as a feature of Roman law, uh, it's already in the 12 tables, okay, so several hundred years BC, um, but goes on to influence large parts of the world through the larger civil law tradition over 2,000 years. Okay? And that we might call global legal history. Okay, so enough about methodology. Let's get, let's get our hands dirty and uh, get into the sources. Okay? So, sources for legal history. These are to some extent defined for us by the period that we're studying and the legal system or systems that we are studying. If it doesn't exist, we can't study it. Um, so we are unfortunately limited to some extent, uh, to some extent by what survives. Okay. However, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't think carefully about which sources you choose. Okay? Or at least think critically about what the historical record has bequeathed to you. You should at least think about who produced the source and why. Think about its immediate context. Think, how did I get this source? Okay, say I'm studying early 17th century Virginia. You're not in 17th century Virginia. How did you get it? Okay, was it written down at the time and later reprinted? Are you looking at an original document written in the 17th century uh, or a later reprinting in the 19th or 20th centuries? And what might have changed in the source? How might it have been repackaged? Um, and of course, uh, what about its form? Okay, the medium. Is it a manuscript? Is it printed? Uh, is it an archival document? I'll say more about these different types of sources uh, in a moment. Um, and of course, always ask yourself, what other sources are there? Everyone else has looked at these sources, but are there others? Uh, there, there's a, a famous joke uh, by a, a Byzantine historian uh, who said that uh, historians are like dogs. They're always going up to the same trees and smelling them, okay? <laughs> Don't be like the dog, okay? Don't just go to the same trees. Explore the forest, okay? Um, printed books. Uh, let's talk about these first of all, okay? If you're interested in pre-modern Western history, like I am, from about 1450, you have... Uh, the invention of printing with movable type, and suddenly hundreds, thousands, in our own day, millions of copies of books being produced. Okay? Uh, for the legal historian, we have, of course, copies of the Justinianic corpus, right? The corpus of Roman law, which is the core of the civil law tradition. We also have treatises both in the common law and in the civil law tradition, collections of opinions, formularies for notaries, all sorts of things that were printed. Printed because there was a market. Okay. You always have to remember that commercial background to printing. Okay. Um, those of you who know a little bit about Chinese history will know about this. Um, Fujian and its great print houses and print markets during the Ming period, say. It's similarly commercially driven uh, in the West as well. Um, if, there, if it's commercially driven, that means there's competition. And in a world without copyright, that means there are multiple editions. There are pirated editions. 
Uh, there are all sorts of different forms of the printed book produced by different people for different markets. Okay? Um, but sometimes a book, even if it was common at the time, is now tremendously rare, especially if it's a school book. If something is printed for students to use, students will you know, write all over it, uh, and then it'll, you know, when you graduate, it'll disappear somewhere, right? It will go in the trash. Um, so maybe there's only a single copy. But that doesn't mean it's not an important book. It just means that the transmission, the route of transmission to us today is not as strong as, say, a copy of the Justinianic corpus, right? A big, expensive teacher's or you know, university library book. Uh, people are not going to throw that away. That doesn't mean it's necessarily more influential in the society. It just means the transmission is different. Okay? If, wh where do you find out about uh, rare books? Well, nowadays with the internet, uh, there are lots of resources you can use. Individual libraries have online catalogs. And there's also what we call global union catalogs, like WorldCat. These collect all the information from multiple different library catalogs around the world. Really tremendous resources. Um, and then most nation states also have national union catalogs as well. I've given you the example of the British one. Um, these are all tremendous resources for finding early modern printed books. Remembering, of course, that the metadata in library catalogs is only as good as the librarian or probably the poor underpaid student intern who did the data entry, right? Imagine it's Friday afternoon after lunch. You're you know, helping out at the library. You might make some spelling mistakes in entering this old, you know, this old title. Uh, you might get confused by different ways of spelling things in the 17th century versus today. You might know that English spelling and pronunciation has changed a lot over time. Um, and there are also different conventions. Uh, of course, use Roman numerals in earlier periods. Um, but for instance, this is the title page uh, of a somewhat late, an 18th century edition of an important treatise. The title is kind of in the middle here. De Justitia et Jure, on justice and the law. Okay? Um, this is not how we would set out a title page today. First of all, it's in Latin, which is the, the ancient language of the law in the West. Okay? Um, but we start off uh, with, this is, this is the name in Latin of a Spaniard, uh, Luis de Molina, but he becomes Ludovicus Molina. And then it tells us who he is, then it gives us the title, and then it tells us that this is a very new edition. Uh, and then it sort of does some advertising. You know, we don't have this in the front of modern books in the same way, right? And then it says uh, where it's printed. It gives the Latin name of the place. That's not the modern place name, so you can get confused. And then it gives, uh, you might, this is sort of an eye test for you, I think. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, an MDCCXXX111, okay, which is, which is a, a date in Roman numerals. Very easy to get confused if you don't, if you don't sort of look at these things every day. Okay, this is 1733. Okay, um, so this is just to give you a sense that it's quite different to work with you know, a book from three or four hundred years ago than a modern book. Even the first page, the title page, has different information. In a sense, more information, richer information. But you have to know the form to understand the content. What else might you have? Manuscripts. 
comes from Latin, manuscriptum, written by hand. Okay? Uh, in the West, even when there was printing, people still wrote things by hand. Okay? Especially if there wasn't a market for 100 or 300 copies. Okay? If you still needed to produce it, you or someone else had to write it out by hand. And they did. Okay, until very recently, in fact. Okay? Uh, what if you didn't want a lot of people to read it? Maybe it was a first draft, or maybe it was something for a small group of people. Say, I don't know, the Inner Temple in London, or I don't know, a sort of a society of American lawyers in Philadelphia. Small group of people. Just you know, write out a couple of copies by hand or get your secretary to do it. The historian might have to read the original handwritten document. Okay? Um, sometimes things were meant to be secret as well. And luckily, we have these historical secrets sometimes. You know, we have the secret correspondence of some of the British monarchs, Elizabeth I, say. Uh, with her secret police. We have that. We have these documents. Okay? But they're written by hand. Um, where are you going to find these things? Okay? Uh, the, the, you'll find them in what are often called special collections departments. Uh, universities and public libraries often have a special part where they keep these handwritten documents. Special climate control and specialist staff who can help you uh, access and interpret them. Okay? Uh, we also have now, in the age of the internet, various resources for finding them at a national or an international level. Um, uh, if you're interested in manuscripts in the US, I've given you a link here. Uh, and of course, Italy right, has a wonderfully rich history, wonderfully documented. The Italians never threw anything away. Okay, um, you can begin to get a sense of the riches of the different collections across Italy uh, from the Manus manuscript catalogue. Uh, this doesn't, if you know where it is, you arrive in Rome, in the, in the uh, I don't know, the Vatican Library, it doesn't mean you can read the document, even if it's in Italian and you speak and read Italian, okay? And it might not even be the language. Remember that not only language changes, but handwriting changes. Okay? So you need to learn a skill, which we call, uh, Americans call it paleography. And we Brits call it paleography. Okay? Uh, the ancient writing reading, I guess, is the, is the translation. Okay, it's from Greek. And here are a couple of manuscripts um, that I use quite a lot at the moment. These are the first pages. And you see the different handwriting styles. Uh, they're both in Latin, written in the Roman alphabet, but they're quite different. Okay? They're both treatises on slave law written by Portuguese missionary jurists in India. The western part of India was a Portuguese colony until uh, 196, the early 1960s. Okay? Um, so just this gives you a sense not only of the, the challenges of reading manuscripts, but also of their genuine beauty, I think. I love working with manuscripts. Uh, they're all unique products of, 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 of individuals that you'll never get to meet, but through their manuscript, uh, give you insight, give you a window into their life and world, okay, you know, through their handwriting. It's a really, I, I love working with manuscripts. And some of them are illustrated. This is all hand-drawn. This is, this is one of my favorites. This is, my, this is the friendly elephant <laughs> uh, that symbolized India uh, because it's a treatise about uh, India in the first instance and then the rest of Asia as well. Okay, um, archives are the final sources I want to talk about. Um, archives are often different to manuscripts, although there's some overlap. Okay, 
When we talk about manuscripts, we're generally talking about personal papers or handwritten treatises, things like that. We're talking about handwritten books. But archives are collections of generally official documents created by a particular state, institution, group, or individual. Okay? Um, so they're handwritten like manuscripts, but they're generally lots of them together, arranged according to some sort of uh, bureaucratic um, sort of system, right, created by the original institution. Okay? So, for instance, um, if you want to study the legal history of Florence and its many institutions, both public and private, you will go to the State Archive. It's just northeast of the town center. And there you will find, for instance, the city-state notarial records. Okay. Um, you'll also find its uh, legislative history as well, um, written by the secretary of their legislative council equivalent. Okay. Um, these are contained in an archive. Um, of course, not just states have archives, as I just mentioned. Right? In pre-modern Europe, the church, especially the Catholic Church, is very powerful and organized, and they have a legal system, and they produce documents, okay? which you'll find arranged according to their particular bureaucratic model. Okay? Uh, if you study Hong Kong history, it's the Public Records Office, and I could go on and on and on. You'll find archives all over the world with different sorts uh, of documents, uh, from the national level to the provincial level, to small towns, to small churches, to small societies, uh, even certain powerful families, especially business families, will have archives, uh, and which may be in private hands. So you have to negotiate uh, with people to get access to them. Another thing about archives I should mention is that documents are not always where you think they'll be. Let's take the example of the Philippines. Okay, the Philippines today is an independent nation state. Okay, but between uh, 1898 and just after the Second World War, it was an American colony. So you'll have to go to Washington, D.C. for some of its documents. And before that, well, it was part of the Spanish Empire, but it was administrated through Mexico because the Philippines was to Mexico like Hawaii is to the United States. It was sort of a sort of distant island province in the Pacific. So if you want to study the legal history of the Spanish Philippines, you have to go to the Mexican archive. It's not obvious. But the documents are there. So, when you're dealing with these manuscripts and archives, as I said, they're often unique documents produced by individuals that have no modern form. Okay? They exist only in their historical form. And this brings us on to another aspect of the legal historian's methodology that of textual editing. Okay? If a source is unpublished and unavailable to other scholars, one of the most important and useful things you can do is to edit it, okay? to publish a modern version that can be published by, I don't know, Peking University Press, and then everyone can read it. Okay? And everyone else can get the historical insights from this original document that is otherwise hidden away in some archive. Okay? So an important part of the role of the legal historian, for some periods more than others, admittedly, is that of textual editing. Okay? This is something I really enjoy, actually. I think it's an important sort of part of service to the legal history profession. Um, and it involves a lot of detective work. Uh, is it really the only copy? You have to go and find out. You have to dig around in different archives. Um, 
If there's more than one copy, you have to identify the relationship between them. Was one copied from another, from another? If, if you're doing med ancient or medieval law, this is very common. You may have six copies. One is from the 9th century, one is from the 14th, one is from the beginning of the 15th century. These were copied by different people. Which copy did they have in front of them to make that copy? Okay, it becomes very sort of technical and detail oriented. Okay? Um, if this is something you're interested in, uh, then there's a great book on this topic, Editing Historical Documents, A Handbook of Practice, okay, which I refer to quite a lot, actually, when I'm doing that. Okay, move on to the final section now. Uh, this is working with sources. Uh, and I want to start with a quotation uh, from our teacher, something he would uh, say, uh, mutatis mutandis, every year to his students. He would say, if you really want to get into the head of someone in another legal system, it really helps to understand the language of the other legal system. If that's not possible, then get a teacher. Uh, get yourself a teacher who knows it well. Okay, So for Western legal history, right, the language of the medieval law in England, the learned law was Latin. Uh, the day-to-day -day language might have been Norman French, the language of the conquerors. The, the French were a little bit like the Manchus in, in Qing China. Okay, uh, He used the Manchu language. They used the Norman French language. Uh, and then, of course, there was English but not modern English, various sorts of old, middle, and early modern English. Okay, So to understand the legal system, you have to have a sense of that. Okay, uh, I encourage you all, if you're studying legal history, think which languages you might need to read. If you're studying the medieval period, as I said, Latin, French, and other vernaculars are useful. If you're studying Thai legal history, lots of people in Thailand are excited about doing Thai legal history, also uh, part of the civil law tradition in many respects, okay? You'll need to learn Thai, English, French. Other traditions are important too. There's a Buddhist tradition in Thailand. You need Sanskrit or other intermediate languages like Tamil. What about Malay? Malay is the language of business in medieval and early modern Southeast Asia. You might need that for reading commercial documents and contracts. Okay, What about middle comer? What about Chinese? Which, of course, you all read very well. But maybe not everyone in Thailand does. Right? The language of the, the Chinese merchants. Okay, Or maybe uh, the diplomatic correspondence uh, between the kings of Siam and the Ming and Qing court. Okay, um, It can get multilingual and sometimes complicated even. But that, I think, is part of the fun. And of course, remember that uh, just as handwriting in the alphabetic world changes over time, so do scripts. Okay? Korea is probably the most famous example. Right? They, they're, they're writing the Korean as syllabary today, but previously they wrote in classical Chinese. There are occasionally other scripts used as well. Vietnam has, of course, classical Chinese, its own version of Hansa, and, of course, the Romanized form today. There are lots of examples like this. Okay. To do legal history, you have to have the right tools uh, for the job. Okay. Um, a final thing about reading a source. Don't rush. Okay. Legal history is a, what the Italians call slow food. Okay, it's about cooking the pasta sauce for many hours. You, you can't rush it because you make mistakes. History is hard, harder than you think. Okay, the past is a foreign country. Ming China is almost a foreign country to today. It's so different. Right? You, you have to prepare for travel to that place. Okay, um, and, and, and I want to give you another quotation from Professor Donahue here. I try to let the text speak to me. What is it saying? 
Don't assume that the words mean what you think they mean. Why is the author saying this? What is he, or occasionally she, assuming that I may or may not know? Can I figure out from what the text says what those assumptions might be? Okay. Is there other evidence as to what they might be? What is there about the context of the text that might help me to understand the answers to these previous questions? Okay. This is his slow food approach. Um, I, when we're talking about context here, I, I, I always think about it like this. I think about it like Russian dolls. Okay, so we have our document, right? And then we go out step by step, you know, from the smallest Russian doll to the biggest one, or perhaps in concentric circles, out from the document to understand the context of the legal system and the society that produced it. Okay, starting with internal explanations, so other parts of the text, or text, other texts that it might refer to, the lifetimes and education of the author or jurist or judge, okay, uh, the legal tradition and intellectual world, politics and society, the economic context, and so forth, okay. Think step by step like that, I think, and you won't go too far wrong. Okay. So just to take an example uh, of the nice manuscript we looked at earlier, okay, uh, it deals with slavery. I've just given you, this was something I was reading recently. It's, it's a section on Japanese slavery, okay. Uh, there were lots of wars in the late 16th, early 17th century in Japan, and people were sold to both Thai and Portuguese merchants. And then jurists began to ask, well, what are the legal underpinnings of this trade? How should it be regulated? And so forth. Um, so this is uh, one section of this particular treatise. Very interesting section. Of, let's say early comparative law or cross-border law, maybe. OK? Um, so I will see at the beginning that he refers back to an earlier chapter, chapter 5. And of course, we should uh, think about these internal explanations. We too should refer back to chapter 5 to understand the context of that particular gobbit or paragraph. Okay? I'll, I'll tell you that chapter 5 deals with general discussions of natural law and the law of nations. This is early international law. Okay. Um, what about the jurist himself in this case? Well, on the one hand, he's a Christian missionary, but uh, he also works as a, effectively an arbitrator uh, between different merchant families. Okay. Um, he had an early education in Latin and Greek classics, including Roman law. So that shapes how he thinks about um, commerce and cross-border transactions between Japanese merchants and Portuguese merchants uh, in Nagasaki. Okay. What about the intellectual context? Well, that treatise uh, that I showed you uh, was written almost as an appendix to the printed book that I showed you earlier, Luis de Molina's uh, de Justitia et Jure, which doesn't talk about Asia. So this person, Gomez Vaz, wrote effectively an appendix to that book, a 600-page appendix dealing with Asia, the same issues in Asia. So you have to read both the original text and the text uh, that builds on it. Okay? And then, of course, we can think of larger contexts. Okay, 16th, 17th century, uh, we have uh, European commercial and imperial expansion. Uh, we have China's move to the silver standard in taxation. Okay, this is late Ming. Uh, we have all sorts of economic, social, environmental changes. We have a little ice age which affects trade and society in really quite significant ways within the maritime Asian system. 
These are all things we might want to consider as legal historians. So my final uh, slide. Uh, if we become a legal historian, or maybe we just want to read more legal history, what are the venues uh, where legal history is found? Uh, and I'll say, first of all, uh, you may be familiar uh, with the various US law reviews. You've probably read a lot of articles and notes. Um, they don't tend to contain, to contain much legal history, and certainly non-US legal history is almost absent. Um, Europe is different. It has a whole different kind of um, scholarly landscape. Um, this said, more specialist uh, US law reviews, especially those in international and comparative law, uh, do publish work in legal history. Um, and you may find interesting articles there. Uh, in addition to that, there are specialist legal history journals. The most famous one in the US is, of course, uh, the Law and History Review. Um, I, uh, Professor Ho and I were just talking about this earlier. Uh, it, it occasionally publishes on Asian legal history, although its historical focus uh, is on North America and Europe from the Middle Ages uh, to today. It has a parallel journal in the UK, the Journal of Legal History, uh, and then there are a couple of famous German uh, legal history journals. Because in the world of the modern university, the Germans are always first. Okay, Oxford might be older, but the first research university was in Berlin. Okay, the modern university began in Germany, and so some of the oldest ones, say the uh, what we abbreviate the uh, the, the ZRG, right, the Zeitschrift der Savigny Stiftung der Rechtsgeschichte, uh, is in is in German. Okay. Uh, books as well, there are, there are probably more interesting books than there are articles in the field of legal history. Um, there's a famous series by Cambridge University Press, uh, Studies in Legal History. Uh, but there are others as well, Brill, Routledge, uh, Springer, all have book series. So if you're interested in reading, or perhaps one day writing some legal history, these are all places you might want to think about. Okay, so... Uh, it's, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> man, 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 okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so, some concluding thoughts then. Um, I've told you, I hope, a little bit about uh, methodology, uh, sources, and then publishing, reading more in legal history. Um, but why do we do legal history? Okay. Um, this is a question that students, and sometimes even professors and administrators ask. Um, in where I live, in, in Hong Kong, it's actually quite useful. Um, the uh, land law in Hong Kong is very, uh, is rooted in a particular historical context, okay, of the late British colonial period. With the small house policy you might know about in the, in the new territories, Xinjiang, is a very particular uh, so, sort of, um, it's a very, the, the land law is very particular. Uh, and there have been cases at the Court of Final Appeal uh, where people have cited from the Qing Code, I you know, uh, the, what's it called, um, Da Qing Lu, okay? The Qing Code has been cited in the CFA in Hong Kong. Okay, legal history matters, all right? Uh, there's often, I think there's also a strong case to be made in legal education to understanding where the system comes from. Um, and I'll note that uh, Oxford requires all its undergraduates to take a course in Roman law to understand the foundations of civil law. Okay. Even though England and Wales is a common law jurisdiction, okay, Roman law is still foundational uh, for understanding um, all Western and arguably all modern law. Okay? Uh, it allows us to perhaps come to terms with some of the oddities in the law as well. Uh, history, history is about accidents, in a sense, uh, and uh, some people think, anyway, the law is full of accidents as well, uh, in the philosophical sense at least. Um, but for me, I think the strongest argument is similar to that for comparative law. As I said, history is a foreign country. The past is a foreign country. People do things differently there. It tells you about what is possible 
what other people have done in other places, how they've solved problems. Okay? It's the closest thing we can do in the humanities and social sciences to running experiments. We can't do the past again, but we can look at the past and try and learn from it. Okay, thank you very much.